On today's episode, we will be discussing situations containing sexual violence. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, and welcome to The Secret Sits. Today's story is one that I have heard my entire life. It's one of those stories that, when I was a kid, was big news. But it was one of those news stories that your parents probably made you leave the room for. This case is all about secrets, and today we are going to talk about those secrets. Today we are going to talk about the kidnapping of Colleen Stan. Now I know that my true crime enthusiasts know exactly what we are talking about, but for those of you who have not connected the name yet, this is the case of the girl in the box. Our story starts In the best year, 1977, it brought the first NASA space shuttle, the first Star Wars movie is released, and the best thing happened in 1977 when I was born. So, in 1977, Colleen Stan was hitchhiking. Man, the 70s and hitchhiking start so many true crime stories. But Colleen is hitchhiking from her home in Eugene, Oregon, to a friend's home in Northern California, where she was expected to attend a birthday party. Colleen was an experienced hitchhiker and had allowed two rides to already go past before finally accepting a ride with Cameron Hooker, aged 24. Colleen felt that this was a safe ride, as Cameron's wife and small infant child were also in the van. They stopped at a gas station along the way, and Colleen went to use the restroom. While in the restroom, she was overcome with emotions, and according to Colleen, a voice told me to run and jump out a window and never look back. But she calmed herself down and proceeded to walk back out to the car. When she arrived back at the car, she noticed a strange-looking wooden box in the back seat that had not previously been there. Once Cameron had driven for a little while longer, he pulled off the highway to an isolated area, and Cameron put a knife to Colleen's throat. This is when she found out that the box was meant for her. It was called a head box, and it was designed to prevent all light, sound, and fresh air from entering. So here we are with Colleen. Her head is now locked inside of this box, lined with carpet material. It's difficult to breathe, and she has no idea what's happening. But someone did know what was happening. Cameron and his wife, Janice. How could this happen? Was Janice complicit in her husband's kidnapping, or was she helping, maybe even controlling, what was happening. Well, Cameron and Janice Hooker had secrets. Cameron Hooker was a sexual sadist. Now this is one of his secrets, and Janice knows his secrets. She knows because she has been the receiver of Cameron's sexual sadistic acts. But Janice was getting tired of the whipping and sexual torture provided to her by her husband. She wanted to have children and be more of a normal wife. So, Cameron and Janice had reached an agreement that he could capture a slave to take Janice's place. However, the rule would be that there could be no sexual penetration between Cameron and his new sex slave. Because in Janice's mind, that would be going too far. And I do want to say right here that we are not here to kink shame anyone. If you're into kink and your adult partner is 100% on board, then have at it. You do you, as my husband would say. So Cameron and Janice Hooker bring their new slave back to their small house. They remove the box from her head and blindfold her and she is ushered down to the basement. Cameron hooks Colleen up to a device that allows him to hang her from the ceiling by her hands, and she is lifted up off of the ground 
and left hanging there. Still blindfolded, and while she is hung there, Cameron physically attacks her, and then Cameron and Janice proceed to have sex directly under Colleen's hanging body. So Janice has secrets too, right? She is complicit with her husband's kidnapping and abusing this girl, and she is so comfortable with it, she's willing to have sexual intercourse directly below his victim. They finish canoodling under Colleen, and Cameron immediately starts rubbing Colleen all over her body. This is about the time when she finally passes out. When she comes to, she's being unhooked from the ceiling. Cameron walks her across the basement, still blindfolded, and takes her to a large crate-type box around the size of an extra-large coffin. He makes her sit down into the crate, and then he puts the head box back on her and just leaves her there. This basement is where Colleen would stay, at least for now. Cameron would only give her short commands, like stand up, sit down, shut up. But Janice would also come down to the basement with Colleen. And at one point, when Cameron has Colleen strung up from the ceiling, Janice walks up to her and bites her on the side of her torso. Janice, or Jan as Cameron would call her, was just a shy 15-year-old girl when she first meets 19-year-old Cameron Hooker. She came from a strong religious upbringing and had never been allowed to date, or wear shorts, or even a two-piece bathing suit. She was very naive and easily manipulated. Cameron asked Jan out on a date, and she replied she'd never been allowed to go on a date before, And if he really wanted to take her out, he would have to ask her parents. So Cameron goes to young Jan's house. And within an hour, he has convinced her overly protective parents to allow her to go out on a date with him. On their first date, Cameron convinces Jan to allow him to undress her and tie her to a tree suspended by her wrists. This is when Jan learns that he is a sexual sadist. Now, a side note about sexual sadists like Cameron. They are aroused by the suffering and pain of others, and that doesn't mean that they are aroused by inflicting pain. It could come from anywhere. However, if you're alone with someone and you want to get your rocks off, you have to do the hurting or there's no pain to get you going. This treatment is humiliating and painful to Janice but she still craves the attention she's getting. Soon he has her suspended by her hands, and her feet are staked into the ground, and he is whipping her. This shaped her sexual responses to Cameron, letting him know just how much he would be able to get away with. In 1975, they marry, and his treatment of his wife only escalates from there until we find ourselves in our current situation with their victim, Colleen. We can now deduce that one of Janice's secrets is that she, in fact, did not enjoy all of this sexual torture, and she feels that the only way to keep her husband satisfied and also survive is to agree to his idea of having a sex slave. She is a compliant victim in this situation, She can have a baby in exchange for allowing him to have a sex slave. This is simply a transaction. After Colleen had been missing for a week, her roommates call her parents to inform them. They drive from their home in Southern California up to Eugene, Oregon, and post missing person flyers along the way. Throughout the summer and fall of 1977, Colleen is kept naked and blindfolded in the basement of their small home. For the first three months, she never even left the basement and had no chances to escape. Their routine consisted of 
Cameron coming down in the evenings, and he would give her something to eat, something to drink, and she would be allowed to use a bedpan. And after that, she would be hung up and whipped. By the end of 1977, the only world Colleen Stan knows is one of torture at the hands of Cameron Hooker and his wife, Janice. In January 1978, nine months after kidnapping Colleen, Cameron gets an idea from an article in one of his bondage magazines. Cameron and Janice present Colleen with a contract to become a slave. It is written out like a legal document. He would own her body. She belongs to him. She has to call him master, and most importantly, she cannot say no to him for anything. Colleen signed the contract. As soon as she signs the contract, Cameron places a giant collar around Colleen's neck. Cameron Hooker then takes things a step further by telling Colleen about an organization called simply The Company. They supposedly enforce these slave contracts and help owners keep their slaves in line in case they are disobedient or they attempt to run away. It was complete fantasy, but he made it seem to Colleen like a reality. They told her they were listening to all the phone lines and watching the house. Cameron then tells Colleen, that Janice was also once a slave who tried to escape, but he married her to save her from being killed by the company. Janice just went along with everything. Once she signed the contract, he would start bringing Colleen upstairs to do house chores. Well, now we could ask, how far will Janice let this go on? But she was getting everything she wanted. She too had a slave to do all of her housework for her. She had a slave to take all of the whippings and torture for her. That was a valid reward for letting things happen. One rule in the house was that any time Cameron yelled out the word attention, no matter what Colleen was doing, she immediately had to go to one particular archway in the house, strip down naked, and stand with her hands at the top of the arch and let Cameron whip her. Colleen tried to be a good slave because she was afraid of the company. In February 1978, Janice suggests that Cameron have sex with his slave that they were calling Kay. Colleen thinks that this was a ploy by Janice to see if Cameron would actually honor his word to her to not have penetrative intercourse with the slave. But Cameron immediately went to the basement and brought Colleen upstairs to the bedroom and immediately started to rape her. Colleen can hear Janice run to the bathroom and start vomiting. Once the door to actual sex was opened up to Cameron, he ran with it, raping Colleen at least once per month when it first started. Four months later, the hookers buy a plot of land just outside of Red Bluff, California, and place a trailer on the land to live in, and they take Colleen with them. But now, with no basement, Cameron had to come up with a new way to contain his slave. He constructed another box that fit into the bed frame of the couple's waterbed. For Colleen to get into it, she has to get onto her knees and slide herself into the box. Once in the box, Cameron seals it up, and she's trapped in this box under their bed, and this is her new home. Colleen spends the rest of 1978 under the bed in the box for five months. She is let out infrequently and only to do housework or to be whipped and tortured and raped by Cameron. Cameron eventually starts letting Colleen out to help him build a torture shed in the backyard. He built a homemade torture rack and would stretch her on the rack until Colleen almost couldn't take it. Two years 
After her capture, Cameron finally takes the collar off and allows Colleen to work in the backyard. For Christmas that year, Cameron decides to give Colleen a gift in the form of a phone call home to her family. He made sure that she knew the company was listening and she had to be careful about what she said. Colleen's dad asked questions, but she was as vague as she could possibly be until Cameron finally made her hang up. By this time, Colleen's parents were starting to believe that Colleen had joined a cult, and they were quite common in California in the 1970s. Now, by early 1981, she has been held captive for three years. Whenever Janice is not home, Cameron is now raping Colleen every chance he gets. But he is also granting her certain freedoms. She is allowed to go for jogs, knowing the whole time that the company is watching her. She has been programmed to believe that this is true. Now, hang on to your butts, because now it's gonna get weird. In March 1981, Cameron tells Colleen that the company has okayed it for her to take a trip to visit her parents. But before she can go, she must first prove her loyalty to Cameron. He makes her kneel on the ground in front of him. He hands her a shotgun and tells her to place it in her mouth. He then tells her to pull the trigger. Now, Colleen has no idea if this gun is loaded or not, but she is so conditioned to do anything he tells her, she does it. And because of this, on March 20th, they go see her family. Cameron preps her along the way with his made-up story about them being boyfriend-girlfriend. He tells her that her parents' house is under observation by the company, and if anything goes wrong, they will kill everyone in the house. So she's not only scared for herself, but also for her family. She introduced Cameron to her father as her boyfriend, and then Cameron just left so she could spend time with her family. There was some made-up story about him going to a convention or something. She shares few details about her life with her family, and they don't press her for any additional details. Her father said he was afraid to ask too much, or she may never come to see them again. Colleen stays home for less than 24 hours, and then Cameron picks her up. When he arrives, Colleen's stepmother says, Hey, let me get a picture of you guys before you go. Now, you should see this photo and I'll share it on our social media. But you would never be able to tell that this girl was dealing with the things that were going on in her life. She is smiling with her head rested on Cameron's shoulder. Cameron is smiling this bright, giant smile. And Colleen even has her arms wrapped lovingly around his shoulders. Cameron drives Colleen back to his house, and she quickly finds that Whatever freedoms she once had were now gone. After this trip, Colleen is kept in the box at all times, typically 23 hours a day, for the next three years. She even had to deal with her bodily functions by maneuvering a bedpan underneath her by using her feet. She was not allowed to make any noise and had to lay still for 23 hours at a time, in the dark, with very little stale air to breathe. During the summers, the temperature in the box would raise to over 100 degrees. In 1984, seven years after her initial capture, Colleen somehow convinces Cameron to allow her to take a job outside of the home to help support the family. She gets a job at a local motel cleaning rooms and is simply enjoying the freedom from the box. But being out of the box didn't spell freedom. As soon as Colleen comes home from work, she has to put her collar back on, and she is chained up to a toilet in the back bathroom. 
This is also where she sleeps, still chained up. Now, because Colleen is so available, Cameron starts having sex with Colleen and Janice on alternating nights. And I will say right now that every single time Cameron Hooker had sex with Colleen Stan, it was not sex, it was rape. Because Cameron had so much power over both of these women, it gives him the idea to build a dungeon so he can collect an army of sex slaves. Because of this idea, Janice starts to unravel. For some reason, she actually loves this man. And the idea of having to share her husband with all these women is more than Janice can bear. Something is changing inside of her. And for the first time, she starts having real conversations with Colleen and seeing her as human. August 9th, 1984, Janice Hooker meets with her local pastor and breaks down and shares everything with him about Colleen. He tells her that this is unnatural and that she needs to get out. Heeding his advice, Janet leaves the church and heads to the hotel where Colleen works. Janice proceeds to tell Colleen that the whole thing is a lie, especially everything about the company. Colleen immediately calls her father in Riverside, California, to tell him she is coming home. But before leaving Red Bluff, she speaks to Cameron Hooker one more time on her terms. She called him on a payphone at the bus station and tells him that she is leaving and there's nothing he can do to stop her. She knows the truth now. Cameron starts crying on the phone. Colleen just hung the phone up and got on the bus and left. Colleen eventually tells her family all of the sordid details. And back in Red Bluff, Janice leaves her husband and goes to the police. And at first, they don't believe her. The Red Bluff police contact Colleen, and she confirms everything Janice has told them. They travel down to interview her, and it takes two days to get through the interview. There was just so much information in seven years. August 22nd, 1984, police arrest Cameron Hooker for sex crimes, kidnapping, and false imprisonment. He just said, okay, and made almost no other reaction. The police go to the trailer to search for evidence, but when they get there, they have a hard time finding anything to place Colleen at the house. Because there's a secret. Between August 9th, when Janice leaves Cameron and frees Colleen, and August 22nd, when Cameron is arrested, Janice has gone back to Cameron, and she has gotten rid of all of the evidence in the home, or so she thought. While police are going through the bondage magazines obtained at the house, a single photo negative falls out of one of the magazines. They hold it to the light, and what do you know? It's an actual photo of the contract Cameron made Colleen sign. Cameron is indicted on 10 counts of kidnapping and rape. For the trial, the prosecution even reconstructed the bed frame and box within it. They placed a mannequin in the box so jurors could see what Colleen had endured. And they left it in the courtroom on display for the entire trial. They even brought in the whips and chains used to torture Colleen. Janice turns state's evidence and testifies against him for full immunity in this case. So this woman, who was complicit and participatory in these crimes, will serve no time. Cameron took the stand in his own defense, and he flat out tells the jury that he did kidnap her, and he did hold her hostage. However, at some point in time, he decided to let her go. 
but she wouldn't leave because she had fallen in love with him and all of their sexual acts were consensual. Well, he was found guilty on all 10 counts and received 104 years in prison. Originally ineligible for parole until 2023, he has had his hearing date moved up seven years to 2015 by California's elderly parole program. On April 16th, 2015, his request for parole was denied. Hooker would not be eligible for another hearing until 2030. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, California officials contacted Colleen Stan and advised her that they were looking to possibly grant him parole in March 2021. Now, A quick update for the case, just so you know, his parole was once again denied. After the trial was over, Colleen studied for an accounting degree, and she tried to move on to a normal life, but misery followed her. She had a string of failed marriages and had a child who ended up in trouble and is now incarcerated. Colleen became a registered associate social worker and has also performed work as a mental health professional. Both Colleen and Janice continue to live in California. However, they no longer communicate with each other. Wow. What a case full of secrets. Sexual sadism, kidnapping and torture, anger and reconciliation. What other secrets do you think this case is hiding? Hit us up on our social media. Don't forget to leave a rating and a review so we can continue to provide you with new and exciting stories. I'm John Dodson, and this has been The Secret Sits. Audio engineering by Gabriel Dodson. Original artwork provided by Tony Lay.